Hey, welcome to the Create Unknown, the home of Make Something Mean Something. Big news in TCU universe is the uh, announcement of Smiling Friends Season 2 is finally upon us. <laughs> so that's very, very, very exciting. Uh, I am Kevin Lieber, and with me as always is Matthew Tabor. Yeah, and the, the training place, or training place, training video is out. Smiling Friends training video. Did you see that? There's been a bunch of really great artists uh, kind of lending their talents to making promotional materials for it. And it's been awesome to see. Yeah. Yeah. There's been some pixel art, been some claymation I've seen. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. And what is it? Sunday night? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. No, everybody's excited. And we were wondering just a couple of weeks ago, we were wondering, hey, uh, what's going on here? (laughs) Yeah. Well, yeah. They really did kind of drop it out of nowhere, but that's how it, 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 that's how they work. You know, that, that's really what happened when the first season dropped. It was just sort of there all of a sudden. And now we're back to being here all of a sudden. So yes, very, very exciting. And um, yeah, hope to get Zach back on the podcast and Michael too. Yeah, that would be awesome. Uh, And I think uh, Hans worked on this one as well. Yeah. Yeah. Hans, um, you know, Brendan, um, I think they brought in, you know, some, some new talent for this season that didn't work on the first one, uh, for, to do some of the art and stuff. So yeah, it, it'll be great to see sort of where they've taken the series. Well, I'm, I'm going to do good news briefly so we can talk about all the bad in the world. Hmm. We need you see, you need 30 seconds for the good news and then like three hours to, to analyze the terrible things. Um, happy birthday to boss threads. He is, how old are we going to say Boss Threads is? Let, let's, what would be the funniest age for Boss Threads? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what a funny I, age I, is. I can't decide whether going really young or really old right. would, would be the best fit. Yeah, I was, I was thinking, you know, he's been, he's been with us from time immemorial sort of thing. That's right. That's right. He, he's like one of those board games where it's like suitable for ages three to 203. <laughs> you know, that that's. <laughs> That's the happy birthday there. Uh, and another is another, it's another one of those success stories of somebody just grinding forever. You know, we talked about NRM doing it and then all of a sudden the break happens uh, and he's nearing 4,000 subs now. Just put out a video that was one out of 10. Um, so that's all continuing to grow. Uh, but Lucifer as well, who's been in the discord um, for years now, uh, Lucifer hit the thousand sub mark. Uh, which uh, after many years of, of just doing the grinding, you know, and it's, it's that case of, well, at a certain point, a little momentum starts to build, uh, and then hit, hit 2000 less than a week later. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's crazy when somebody has put literally nine or 10 years into something, uh, and then it begins to roll like that. But you know, that's what happened with, with Jimmy, Mr. Beast, where he was, a zilch on YouTube forever grinding away. Uh, and then it began to build and, and, and now it appears Mr. Beast has a viable channel. He's okay. He's, he's okay. You know, 10 years it's sustainable is actually the, uh, the benchmark when I used to be like super into stand up comedy. That's what I'd always heard that 10 years is what it takes to get any good at all. If you're ever going to get any good at doing stand up, that was just so what happens if you're in your 15th year of stand up and you still suck. Um, yeah, I don't know, but I mean, there are varying. Do you just say, "Hey, this is a hobby for me, and I enjoy it, so I'm going to continue my mediocrity." It, it could be, but it could be a case where, like, you're good for cruise ships, and you can get those gigs, right? Oh. Or you're good for yep. some repeat gig in some club, someplace, and you know, you host the open mic. There, are, there, are, there are levels, <laughs> you know. So maybe you find your niche in one of those levels after. 15 years, but, and you don't get a Netflix special, well, but either way, you know, there is always a role for everybody. We were talking this morning about how some, sometimes, uh, you're the, the all-star first baseman and, and sometimes you're the groundskeeper. <laughs> so, uh, both uh, yeah. of these have their place. Um, so yeah, it, it's all it's just more and more good news, you know, and if you've got it, tell us, tell us, drop a comment, jump in the discord, tweet at us, whatever it is, anything, nothing is too small because all of it's good. It is all good. And what, what I need to know from you now at this point, now that we've gotten the good news out of the way is that, uh, earlier today that you told me that you've, you've cracked some codes, you've unlocked some areas Mm -hmm. of your brain that, uh, otherwise remained locked. 
due to watching a program called My 600 Pound Life. Now, I don't know, you yeah. know what secrets have been revealed to you, what veils have been lifted, but I'm interested in hearing about it. There are actually a lot in, in this show, um, but I, I want to explain why why I do this and, and why it matters in general. Okay. So, um, there is, there's really never been a better way to look at real human behavior than reality TV. Okay. And it, that's a, such a big umbrella that a lot of things under it are ridiculous and heavily edited and all of that. But like, what was the context in which you mentioned intervention a little while back? Oh, geez. I, I don't know, but but I have watched a lot of intervention and yeah, I mean, those sort of um, limit case shows like an intervention or like a my 600 pound life in which you're seeing someone like on an extreme end of a problem. Um, th yeah. Those limit cases are where you kind of see little problems that other people can get through uh, really snowball and manifest and you know, now it's time to yeah. figure out how am I going to survive, you know? Yeah. And even the business shows, whether it's a restaurant business, you know, how popular the kitchen nightmares style stuff is, or a show like the profit, which both of us liked a lot. Those are certainly edited for narrative, highly edited, whatever, but the core things that happen uh, tend to be very real and very useful. Well, there's, there's a genre of like super real reality TV in which shows like Hoarders and My 600 Pound Life fall in, where it's you're really getting a, a raw look at something that's very, very complex. Um, uh, I, I did a video about a year ago on Hoarders because I, I was watching this show and I realized that it perfectly encompasses uh, the complexity of how much latitude an individual has to live their life. Because what you, you watch a show like Hoarders and, you know, if this guy wants 17 cars in his driveway, uh, why, why is that a problem for anybody else? Well, it can become a problem when the next door neighbor uh, has plummeting property values. All of a sudden, this guy living his life has a negative effect on somebody else. And when you get a case of infestation, for example, where somebody has so much garbage that, that rats, uh, you know, are, are all over their property. Well, they, those rats don't respect picket fences. So they wind up in, in everybody else's yard. It's like, okay, where does your freedom to do whatever you want, uh, end, and my freedom to be free from it begin. This is muddy as hell and different places and different types of people have different answers for where they draw that line. Uh, so you can watch a show like hoarders and see people doing this for a lot of different reasons. Um, you can see why they, they hoard, you know, some of them have severe, uh, severe, um, trauma that that's pushing them in, in this direction and they can't, you know, they can't get out of it. Uh, uh there are others too, where you, you get collectors where they, they will have a collection that's completely ruined. They've put it together and then it's not maintained at all. And the whole thing gets ruined. And it's like, well, what's happening here? Because if you really love that stuff, you do this in a different way. Well, something else is happening with that I, person. I have a really good example of that uh, exact person because there's an episode of Hoarders in which a person, a guy collects, I think it was beer cans. I'm almost positive it was beer cans. Okay. And he has thousands of of beer cans just absolutely stacked up everywhere in the show uh, as part of helping him organize and go through his collection they built this floor to ceiling beautiful shelving system and then helped him display his collection properly rather than just being in piles it was just like pallets and piles of cans that's what his collection was they created uh, essentially a beer can museum he was furious he hated this was he really yeah 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 his reaction to this blew me away because i you know in my mind i'm like oh my gosh this is like the nicest thing they could possibly do for this guy is they turn his thing yeah. you know his his life's work his life's collection into this gorgeous museum and and he can look through all the cans and and see them and appreciate them hated it was 
furious that they did this to his collection. Yeah. So this is why these shows are valuable because <laughs> yeah. that's right. You look at it and say, okay, this is not what, this is not about what I thought it was about. And you get all different iterations of that over the course of, I don't know how many seasons Hoarders is in 10, 11, 12. I don't know. Uh, so I love watching these shows and I'll watch the entire thing uh, from episode one, season one until it's done. Uh, I, I go through the entire thing and think about all of the episodes. And usually there's somebody to talk about with them, too. Um, so I really enjoy that. And it does take a lot of time. But the insight that you get from it is tremendous. Absolutely tremendous. Um, I, I've, I've gotten a great deal of useful information from hyper analyzing hoarders. Well, the, the thing after that for me was my 600 pound life. Um, and that one has been even more useful. There is a lot in that show that, that is directly relevant to many of the themes that we talk about, uh, it, to the point where I almost don't know where to begin. Um, it, it matches up with with uh, a show like Hoarders, where, you know, again, at the root is something is going on psychologically for the people of this show. So that common thread is there. Uh, but it's also all sorts of reasons. Some people uh, have just straight up food addictions, just like alcoholism or anything else. Others uh, turn to food because of, of trauma or difficulties of, you know, whatever kind. Um some just had really destructive habits. And by the time it became obvious how bad it was for them, they were in so deep that they felt hopeless. Uh, and it's like, well, at this point, why, why do I bother? Like I'm past the point of no return. Uh, and some of them are. Um, and, and I like the, I mean, as twisted as this is to say, you, you want to see them all work out, but the reality is just like intervention or hoarders or anything else, not all of them are going to, you know, and it's that glimpse into the, the realistic outcomes, um, is really worthwhile. So, so step one here is consider watching shows that show real life and really thinking about what's happening with, with all of the people in that show. Um, so 600 pound life is, I almost really don't know where to start with this. Um, but the first really big thing that hit me, uh, is, is the misunderstanding of what motivation is. And, and it, it resonates with almost all the talk I've seen surrounding YouTube and all of that stuff, writing books for as long as I can remember. Everybody thinks like, oh, I, I, you know, I'm not motivated to do this. I don't, I don't have, you know, that thing driving me to do it. Okay. So this is a theme throughout 600 pound life as well is keeping up the motivation for a thing. Sometimes people have a, an immediate threat to their life if they don't change their, their lifestyle immediately. Right. Others, uh, know they're in a bad place, might be a young person, uh, who, who can, get back to a really good place, you know, and they want to, uh, enjoy the rest of their life and have a fulfilling life. Uh, others have kids and the motivate or a husband or a wife. And the motivation is, um, you know, I, I want to do this for them. Uh, or sometimes, especially in the case of the, the couples, um, they're in a position where they, that person is doubles as a caretaker for them. And they want to relieve the burden that they've placed on, on the person they're in a relationship with. Now, th this makes for good TV. The, the, motivation, um, the motivation is something that you can see waffling through anything. And people talk about this with writing as well. It's like, what's a character's motivation? What's his motivation? Okay, the motivation is actually a two-second thing. That's it. And that's all it should ever, ever be. There's a reason that you want to do something. That is the motivation. Whether it happens, how well it works, how long you're able to do it, that is not motivation. That is 100% 100 uh, discipline. And it's the execution of that discipline. Executing that discipline and whatever regimen is attached to it, whether it's writing a book, uh, whether it's writing a YouTube video, um, whether it's exercising or eating well, has nothing to do with the motivation. 
Motivation is what kicks the discipline in action. And then all of a sudden, oh, Boss Threads is in the chat now. Happy birthday to Boss Threads. We we gave you a nod at the, the top of the show. Um, they are they are distinctly different things. And when you confuse the two, it's bad. Okay? It is the most undermining, uh, uh, sort of destined for difficulty, if not failure, thing that you can do. So they don't make the distinction very well between the motivation to take a course of action and then the discipline to stay on that course of action. Yeah, um, no one ever talks about discipline yeah. with this. It always is motiv- motivational yeah. speaker, a motivational book. When when you're right, the, the motivation is just to achieve a goal. Like, that's easy. <laughs> That's, you don't have, there's not much to it. There's not a lot there. Yeah. It's just, I want to look better in a bathing suit, you know, whatever it is, but actually (laughs) having the discipline to look better in a bathing suit. That's the hard part. Yeah. The discipline element is the question of, well, now what that comes after motivation. Mm -hmm. And that is obviously everything we decided many years ago to do a podcast. We had motivations to do that. All sorts of them. And they were all real. They were all legitimate. And then we had to figure out how to do a podcast and then how to do it for 200 some episodes. That had nothing to do with motivation. That had everything to do with uh, discipline to execute the thing that motivated us. And this is why it's so important in this particular show. Nobody in the show ever has a problem with a motivation. They want to go back to work. They want to do this for their kids. Uh, They want to be able to just go and do all the things that they can't right now because of their physical state. Well, then it gets complex. It gets complex. Um, And they're seldom honest about how their motivation is in a fine, healthy place and their discipline is anywhere from shaky to non-existent. Uh, And I remember reading, I was watching the show, I remember reading... um, over well, no, it was about twenty years ago. Reading a book called "Focused for Bowling," uh, and it was about the psychology of bowling. It wasn't a bestseller. Uh, I, I forget the guy's name who wrote it, Dean something. Uh, but there's there's a page in this book where it, it, the, I'm paraphrasing, but he, he says essentially, people will will say to me, I, I would do anything to you know be a pro. I, I, and I hear this too, like I would do anything to be Mr. Beast, <laughs> to be, to be a Vsauce, to have a, a career doing the thing I love. That's something that's sustainable. And I just want to be a, an artist, a creator. <sighs> okay. Well, you have to ask questions here. So if you would do anything for it, um, if I could, if I told you, I can guarantee this, uh, we will do this, but you're going to have to be away from your family for 12 months. You will not see them or talk to them at all. Kevin, you, you, your parents, your siblings, your wife, they are dead to you for a calendar year. You'll see them after that, but 12 months. Um, w- would you do that? Yeah. And very few people are going to say yes. Very few people will make that trade. And that's important because then it's all right. Then you won't do anything for this. And that's okay. That's not proof that you're not committed to it, but it's establishing the bounds of how you're willing to go about it. Those bounds are real. Um, so you hear somebody say, you know, I would do anything for my kids. And then the reality is that there are boundaries to their definition of anything. Um, sometimes it's really destructive. Other times it just, you know, it's sensible, right? Uh, but they make a claim, they have a motivation, and then they don't put it in the context of their real life and what, what's truly important to them and how they live. Um, the other thing that pops up in, in virtually every episode here is, uh, hey, spoiler alert, the episodes are like an hour and a half long, not because uh, Dr. Now, who's awesome, uh, his the name of his book is People Do Not Lie, or I'm sorry, Scales Do Not Lie, People Do. <laughs> and, and that sums up, if you've never seen the show, his approach to like, Hey, there, there's one way to do this. <laughs> and if you do it, you succeed. And if you don't, you, you don't. 
He's a no nonsense guy, which, which which I should say happens a lot in the show where uh, because they have to regularly go back to weigh in to see what progress they're making. Right. So so part of going to doctor now he sets goals. Yeah. Part of going specific to specific goals, lose this much in a month or two months, come back. And this is how you qualify for his weight loss surgery. Right. You can't just walk in at 600 pounds and get the surgery. You have to go through his yeah. program that shows you're committed to the to you have the discipline uh, uh, on top of the motivation to actually lose this weight. And that includes um, proving that you will over the course of months and um, people come in and they have gained weight sometimes and they'll be shrug, shrug their shoulders. I don't know how that happened. And so that's really where the uh, scales don't lie. People do think comes from. Right. And it's, yeah, there, there are reasons why it happened. It's there, there's not a lot to it. No, you know, and I, and I am uh, brutally, I try to be brutally honest with myself about this where, you know, I was talking the other week. It's like, ah, I got myself into a bit of a bad place in physical health. Uh, I need to shape that up. Well, what is going to do that? Uh, and what am I doing that is counterproductive here? Uh, and it's, it's really mundane stuff. It's really mundane stuff that, that adds up. Uh, and you can't have you can't have kind of poor discipline if you actually truly have this goal. Um, and that's the thing that you see play out in real time in this show is how real the goal is for different people. You know, and some are fantastic, and you're rooting for them, and some are very damaged, and you feel sad for them. Uh, and others have every bit of support you could expect, you could hope for everything going for them and they just piss it away. And, and you're like, well, you know, you don't want to wish ill will on anybody. Um, but, but like, come on, <laughs> you were given everything. There's no more that the world can do for you. This is on you. Um, so seeing that range is, is, is pretty useful because the only way you used to be able to get this, and we talked about this a long, long time ago is reading fiction watching movies, seeing other stories that are not similar to your life, uh, and seeing how the, the people in those stories navigate it all. Uh, that's incredible to, to see all those different paths for all the people involved. Um, it takes a long time to even realize what's in a book and often a movie. It's, it's more efficient when you can just watch it very neatly placed in a line for you over like an hour. Um, well and stories are are, are a lot of times i mean they're made to be entertaining they're made to to have certain structures and i mean the shows that you're talking about are are documentaries really they're not it it, it's it it does it a disservice to bucket it as reality tv and in in the same way something like um something else (laughs) i don't know the real the real housewives of orange county i don't know that's like obviously Uh, not a documentary. It's just over the top sensationalism, but hoarders and it's entertainment. Yeah. 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 It's meant to be an entertaining show. It's not meant to document a person's journey through dealing with a disorder or some sort of, you know, health liability. That's, those are very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and the people who film the show, the crew has a policy not to intervene under any circumstances. And I've only seen them violate that once. Uh, where a car broke down in the middle of like a six lane interstate and they helped, they got out of their car that was filming, uh, and helped push it to the side of the road because that was like true emergency, but people have, you know, they fall and and stuff like that. And the crew doesn't fix that situation. They, they, you know, there will be a 911 call and paramedics will, will come and address the situation, but the crew is not jumping in here. So they're truly documenting the thing. Um, but the, the language, and this is the next step here, the language that's used in this show is, is really important to think about. Um, one of them is the language around weight loss. The term weight loss is my problem. Loss is, it, it, this is the rare example. I don't, I don't think words matter that much most of the time. But occasionally they can completely change an attitude towards something. And this is one of those cases, weight loss. Uh, Loss is a euphemism here. Just like, you know, I I lost 
I, I lost my dog. I lost my my grandparent. But no, you're saying that because you you know it's a little too raw to say what actually happened there. But with weight loss, look, I I lose my car keys. I lose the remote in my my bedspread. I lose those things. You don't lose weight. You have to take a deliberate series of actions to make that weight go away. You have to change what you eat. You have to change uh, your physical activity, if you can, to the extent that you can. A lot of the people in this show have really limited options there, so they have to start small. But you, you take this tremendous series of steps to make that thing go away. You have to eliminate it. You have to burn it. In the case of fat, it's proactive, not reactive. It's something you do. It's not something that's done to you. You losing your keys is something. Well, that you you can't find them, but um, yeah, like ah, this this unfortunate set of circumstances has hit me. I have placed my keys where I don't normally place them, and then I forgot where I. I <laughs> oh, isn't that a chuckle worthy? <laughs> like these are not the same thing, and you don't gain weight the, the same way, like. We talk about gaining experience. Like, no, no, no. There's no mystical shit here. Okay? It's not like that. It's it's the reverse of those same actions. You are gaining weight because your intake is this and your physical activity is that, and there's an imbalance. So you are, you are taking on, through your actions, what turns out to be weight. That's really critical to me when you when you admit that that it's really about about the actions here and how deliberate you have to be. Uh, that's really one of the problems with the billions of people who I've talked to in different capacities over the years uh, who, who seem to think that they can just kind of like will a creative career into happening. It's like if they if they want it for the right reasons, it's going to eventually just happen. Manifestation. <laughs> manifest yes <laughs> they'll manifest that's Get a, a big thing now isn't it, it is yeah yeah i'm gonna manifest it kevin w- would you say that you manifested your career or is it more like i don't know being dead tired after frying chicken wings and sitting in front of premiere uh, until your eyes bleed yeah well i was i think i was having this conversation with somebody recently where it was like oh how did you get to your start it's like well i worked two jobs, six days a week so that I could afford the apartment I was living in. And then after work every night from those six jobs, I would then go to my other job, which was working on my creative stuff. So it was really like, yeah, work all the time so I could afford to work more. (laughs) That's how I got my start. That's how it worked out. And eventually you could make a switch eventually over time, over years of very deliberate actions. And also earlier when you were talking about like, you know, oh, I'll do anything in order to get this thing. Well, Mm -hmm. I've spoken about this before on the podcast, but like one of the things that I received was kind of ridicule and mockery from my coworkers at that time who, you know, just thought I was super weird. I didn't hang out with them. Um, I didn't go to the you know, the after parties and these shows that they were going to and like this bar or whatever, I would go to work and then I would go home and work on what were really weird, stupid videos and cartoons and stuff on this new thing called YouTube. So yeah, it was weird, but I did receive like derisive comments and kind of, you know, outsider in, in many ways behavior in my social circles of that time for doing that. So look, that was a thing I was willing to do. I was willing to be the weird guy that everyone was like, what's wrong with Kevin? Uh, I was willing to accept that for the glimmer of hope that, you know, I could stop working those jobs and just focus on creative stuff full time. That was a sacrifice. That's the reality of it. That's that's the process that kicks in and then sticking to it. And so I want to go back to the notion of discipline where I don't think very many people have thought about what that means. They've, they've thought about it to like level one, which is like discipline being, here's the set of rules I have or the path that I have to follow. And it encompasses my ability to stay on that path. That's obviously what the word means. And that's not wrong. But there's another level to it as well, where think about, think about the words discipline 
and disciple. Okay. A disciple is somebody who follows somebody else. Jesus had disciples. Kevin, I'm sure there are Vsauce disciples. Hopefully, hopefully when we turn this into a full-fledged cult, this podcast, (laughs) we will have unknown disciples. But you get this notion of here's a thing that is leading as you or the disciple follows. Well, what happens in discipline? You are following you. That, that, that's baked into that word. The person you're following is yourself and what you have set out for. It. And, and that's, a, a, that's a pretty strange realization when you realize that you occupy both of those roles, where you are both the leader and the follower of whatever you're trying to do. And this is the same for exercise, eating, YouTubing, writing, uh, literally anything. There's a component where you are leading and you are following. And that is discipline. It's a distinctly different thing than just how do I stick to this plan? So yes, when you're following the leader, whether it's somebody else or you, you're sticking to a plan. That's that's a component here. But when we're talking about discipline on personal action, oh, you have to realize that you are both the leader and the follower. And that means you set the agenda as the leader and you execute the agenda as the disciple. There's a, it's, it's a very powerful combination to have. Well, it's um, important to contextualize it too, because you can think of it in terms of something like exercise where people have personal trainers, right? Because in, in that instance, they are a disciple of the personal trainer and they need that connection. They need that mentor to follow, right? And I think that works for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, if you can't afford that though, because they're expensive, Well, guess what? Now you've just done what you're talking about, where you have squashed the, you've become your own personal trainer. (laughs) You're the, you're the trainer and the trainee in one. Yes. Virtually everybody who listens to this podcast is a serious self-starter. They, they are a grinder in one way or another where they want to be. Um, they, they need to embrace knowing that they're in both roles because it's awesome too. Once you realize it and understand the relationship between you and you, <laughs> those two versions <laughs> versions of you, everything gets much, much easier. So imagine if you were like a manager managing an employee, but you knew every single one of the employee's thoughts. You knew 100% of what they thought and felt and believed. And imagine being the employee and knowing 100% of your boss's thoughts. I don't have to imagine that because that's my life. <laughs> Between the spy cams uh, and, and the Neuralink, I, I I understand Kevin. But think about what what how amazing that would be for both parties. Bit creepy, bit difficult, but you know, full access to to both sides. Uh, well, that that's you. That's you when you're both <laughs> the leader and the disciple. And when you realize that, oh, it's just it's incredibly useful, and it just is so relaxing. It's, it's, you just get everything when that happens. Well, the the second bit of language is on responsibility and it's the same concept. Uh, it's also built into the word. It's the same component as sponsor. Well, a sponsor would have responsibility for you. They they're taking responsibility for you. A responsible sponsor is supporting you and, and, you know, putting you on the right path or giving you the tools you need or, letting you do your thing, but making it possible by giving you resources, whatever. There are a lot of ways to sponsor. Um, Responsibility is sponsoring yourself. You are both the sponsor and the one who's being sponsored. It's the same relationship as in discipline, where you realize that you're both of these things at the same time. And as you watch a show like 600 Pound Life, you can see where this gets out of whack for everybody on the discipline, on the the responsibility, where there's a mismatch. They don't have this in a smooth direction. It's not flowing, um, misaligned, however you want to put it. And ultimately, somebody isn't responsible when they're not executing the role of being their own sponsor. Um, It's easy to see when they just blow it off. You're like, okay, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. Yeah, that's one way to not be responsible. But it means they've also failed to be their own sponsor to get that that person inside them to do what they want to do. Which a lot Does of makes a sense? lot of people, yeah, a lot of people have this problem, and I'm sure everyone listening probably knows someone in their life who uh, will do anything for someone else, 
We'll do anything for like oh. their kids or their pets. Yep. We'll do anything for them and we'll do nothing for themselves. So that so they will like bend over backwards to help out and and uh, their kid or their dog or whatever it is mm -hmm. and then just treat themselves like they don't matter. That's right. That is very common. That's exactly what you're talking about. It is. Yeah, and I know a lot of those people. I'm close to a lot of those people where they will bear any burden for anybody else. It's it's remarkable what they will endure and take on to help somebody. And that obviously is an incredible trait. Uh, at the same time, they will miss very basic elements of, of uh, you know, taking care of themselves. And well, the result here is that when you don't take care of yourself, then you're less able to help those people. So there's a balance between uh, helping others and putting yourself in a position to really to, to help them efficiently and, and happily, right? Yeah. You know, you're no good to anybody if, if your own life is toast. Yeah, I, I knew a person once who would cook like insane meals for their dog, like uh -huh. like a $20 dinner for the dog. And then they would eat, you know, junk food, candy and cereal. And meanwhile, the yeah. dog is eating like like they're at a five star restaurant and and they would just, you know, snack on junk. It's like, <laughs> this is yeah. not right. <laughs> Jen says in the chat, you have to treat yourself like somebody you love. Uh, that's one of the issues that that people in the show deal with, you know, and, and there's a, a great psychologist. Uh, his name is Matthew Paradise in the show, um, and he's very good at, at getting people to realize this. And most of the time, uh, you know, there's there's uh, self-respect missing and, you know, really caring about about somebody about, you know, themselves in their own life, uh, usually because they put it in to such a bad place where it's been put in a bad place. I mean, some of the tragedies that these people have endured are shocking. I mean, you wonder how they're even still alive because such horrible stuff has happened to them. Uh, but you, you have to see these stories and start thinking about what's really happening, what the pieces of it really mean. And you get, you get really tough, tough spots that are applicable elsewhere. So for example, almost all of these shows uh, you know, there's a supporting actor in the thing where it is that family member, the a parent quite often. And that's a weird dynamic because a parent is, is seeing a child suffer and very well, uh, could die before them. This is a horrible thing. Um, but some of them are straight up enablers of the problem and you see that play out. And it's a very real thing where to, to what degree, are you hard nosed about this when you, when you know that you're going to cause pain and make somebody uh, be unhappy if if you don't do what they're what they're asking you to do? Well, that situation comes up about eight times a day in real life in one way or another. Uh, that's that's really something to consider, and you get to see all of these different ways it plays out. And and some people have just resigned themselves to it not being a fixable problem. Others cannot bear the thought of hurting that person they love. So they'll continue to do the thing that really hurts them. I mean, it, this is the complexity of real life. Uh, you don't get that in reality TV like Desperate Housewives. Yeah. In my 600 pound out life, it's like getting them a, a pizza that they're not supposed to have. That's what, right. That's what you're talking about. Right. It's like, hey, yeah. I really, really, really want a pizza. Um, you know, it'll, it'll be fine. OK. And they give in. And they sneak it in like through the hospital window. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And seeing the way people talk about uh, about those situations when Dr. Now will call them out. So if you get somebody who can't move on their own, like they can't go grocery shopping and, and make the food, somebody's bringing them all their food. You know, he's like, well, uh, if you're overeating, it's because you have that food in front of you that, you know, your husband brought to you. That, that's it. Food does not magically appear. Somebody brings it to you. So let's be honest about what happens here. And it, it, they will often say something like, well, I just eat whatever people bring me. Mm. Think about the language in that sentence. When the reality is you live with one person, his name is Steve. Steve is there all day taking care of you. This is not what people happen to bring you. It's not the universe. Sort of like how, yeah. <laughs> no, no. It's sort of like the way weight loss is that vague thing. It's not how it works. Uh, 
No, this is about what Steve brings you. And Steve is bringing it to you because you asked for it. Somebody, Steve, went out and bought it. Steve had it in the, the kitchen and prepared that food for you and or ordered it, picked up the delivery or the takeout or got delivery. It's all these deliberate steps that get to this outcome. Uh, but there's not a recognition of that in the language they use to talk about it. And when the people start to get specific and honest about the language, it's almost always correlated with them executing what they need to do to improve their health. I, I don't think I can recall a mismatch where somebody was vague in their mindset, they weren't honest about it, and still succeeded. So that is the, the to bring it all together moment, um, it is all of these things are, are really what determine whether it's going to work out. Yeah. All of them. Literally all of them, right down to the words you use to describe the thing. Yeah, yeah. Once you get away from the euth euphemisms and you can get a little bit r more real about what's actually happening, well, I could see how there'd be a correlation between um, facing reality and, uh, and making a change or at least interacting with it more directly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm on board with you with these types of shows. I really like them as well. Um, and you mentioned the financial ones like the profit, which sadly is no longer running. Yeah. Um, even Shark Tank, I think, has a lot of lessons in it, even as goofy as it is. These are shows that you should be watching to learn more about yourself, your family, other people. I mean, it really, Everybody it really is like a, a life hack in order to learn yes, about human behavior that I think is lar yep. largely kind of un under underappreciated for sure. Um, in a few weeks, you can get what takes you, what, what took people a lifetime, the human insight. It took them a lifetime to get 50 years ago. Now you can pound it out in like six weeks. Yeah. And it, it truly is like that. You develop empathy. You de develop like dis right. discernment. You develop like all kinds of stuff. It's not, it's not a case of like gawking at weirdos. No. It is much more about learning about them, learning about their family, and then how it relates to you and your experience. So definitely recommend doing that. Um, we're out of here for this week. Uh, thanks to all of our patrons in the chat for hanging out with us. It's lovely to see you. Go to patreon.com slash the create unknown to support this podcast. And until next time, folks, we will see you, Space Cowboys. Thanks for listening to The Create Unknown. We make this show with the support of our patrons. 100% goes directly to keeping episodes going every week, and we've been shocked by all the new support this year. The world's ending and I'm late for work. Gib Tom, Sid Pope, Demetrius, Atrocious Guff. You guys really do make this show happen. Thank you to the Tots and Dumpster crew, old and new, who save tiny little lives every month. And thank you to our grizzled, battle-hardened child infantry. Jen Mefasanti, Kevin Menard, Mikhail Steinke, Risebread, Sean Malone, Triple Question Mark, Ryan, Kamikaze, Maria, Marco Sheep, Tom Videogre, Jelksies, and Dan the Latch. And a tremendous shout out to our elite baby gang commanders, Linus and Trevstead, Boromir, Bot Dogs, Chinchilla, Isaac, Conrad, James, Andrew, Jeff Davis, Patrick Pister, Baseweight, Monahim, Dojangles, and Zero. You really are the elite. Thank you as well to our indentured servants, producer editor Ben Webster, Discord Savior Ladderman, and producer emeritus Dan Yoshua. And thanks to Baseweight for the use of Created in the Unknown for the opening theme, and to Electro Voice for giving us mics to sound good on top of it. The Create Unknown is an unknown media production in partnership with Studio 71. <laughs>